Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Kasia Gonerman, Dean of the UAD Libraries, and it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to the 42nd Annual Reynolds Finley Historical Lecture. For the first time in the distinguished history of the Reynolds Finley Historical Lectureship, today's event is conducted virtually, which is clearly a testament to how differently we all work, cope, and conduct our lives in the time of a pandemic. I'd like to take an opportunity to express my sincere appreciation for the continuous support of the Reynolds Finley Associates and Steering Committee, for Dr. Wayne Finley and his family in particular, and for the engagement and support of our friends and donors. You all help us make the historical collections exemplary and unique and contribute to their steady growth. Reynolds Finley Historical Library, under the curatorship of Peggy Balch, continues to expand its collections of rare books, manuscripts, journals, and pamphlets pertaining to the history of medicine, science, and healthcare dating from 1300s to the mid 1900s. As you all know, the event tonight is co-hosted by the University of Alabama Medical Alumni Association and Dr. Selwyn Vickers, Senior Vice President and Dean of the UAB School of Medicine. It is my pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Vickers who will now introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, Dr. Marazzo. Thank you, Dean Gunnerman. Um, this is a great opportunity to introduce Dr. Marazzo, but I wanna thank Dr. Wheat and the Medical Alumni Association for all their support. And I look forward to this weekend as they all come together virtually. So Jimmy Razzo is uh, well known to many across the globe. As you'll see on her slide, she's the Glenn C. Copps professor and the director of the Division of Internal, Division of Infectious Disease in the Department of Internal Medicine. She is an outstanding clinician, but most of all, I would argue a consummate academician. Jenny attended Harvard undergrad, Jefferson Medical School, Yale for her residency, and the University of Washington for her ID fellowship where she served for over 15 years on their faculty. It took us a little bit of an effort that is with Dr. Lendefeld's leadership and my participation to get Jeannie and Joe to Birmingham, but we've never regretted a day that they are since they arrived. Jeannie as what I mentioned is the consummate academic physician and, and what I mean specifically about that is that the individual who lives in the world of cutting edge knowledge. And Jeannie is a, a world renowned expert on sexually transmitted disease, including human papillomavirus and HIV. That skill set was really brought to bear as we related to the coronavirus infection that we've all suffered from throughout the last several months, particularly 2020. Jeannie's knowledge, her compassion, and her skill as a physician connected with the populations in Alabama, Birmingham, America, and the world. And as we know, the most uh, caring physicians combined being the most competent physicians are our goal for all of those who serve in academics. Eugenie has met that goal as we've loaned her to be a spokesperson for truth, for concern, and opportunity to move forward, again, not only for Alabama, but for America and the world. So today and this evening, we look forward to hearing Jeannie's talk regarding the pandemic, where we are now and where we, what do we have to look forward to as we move, move ahead. So again, without further delay, I would ask you all to tune in and pay close attention to the lecture to be given by Dr. Jeannie Marazzo. Jeannie? me. Dr. Vickers, thank you so much for that incredibly kind uh, introduction. Um, 
it has been uh, my privilege this year to, to serve in this capacity. And I also wanna thank Dean Gonerman as well as the Medical Alumni Association and Dr. Wheat for inviting me to do this talk. Um, and I'm going to try in the space of a very brief period, about 35 minutes, so it will be lightning speed, to take you through some of the highlights of where we've been and what can we expect. I think we've all lived through this year, so you don't need to be reminded how harrowing it has been, but I'll try to give you some highlights and if you show me the next slide, I want to point out, please, uh, uh, Beth, if you don't mind, um, on the next slide, what you'll see is the reason that I've been able to do this. And I've been able to be the spokesperson that Dr. Vickers mentioned because I have an incredible group of faculty, every single one of them, whether or not they worked in COVID directly, provided incredible support through so many mechanisms this past year. And we really could not have done this as an institution uh, without their participation. And that's in the setting of thousands of people at this institution pitching in and really living the, our values in a way that makes me very proud to be here. So I really wanna call out uh, my faculty who've again, made it possible for me to do what I did this year. I'll take the next slide, please. So here's a brief outline of the talk. I'm gonna start with a theme that is a famous quote from the philosopher George Santayana, which is those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And indeed, we will reference some common themes, especially since this is a historical lecture to the great epidemic of 1918. And I include some fantastic images here of, of various uh, remedies that may be reminiscent for you of hydroxychloroquine um, and also the former mayor of Birmingham who endorsed, endorsed uh, something called TANLAC, which is a tonic that's shown there, which the ingredients do not really sound uh, particularly helpful for influenza, but are very interesting. So we'll start a little bit with that, just a couple of slides, and then very quickly review where we are now. Why are cases declining? And it's very clear that they are in most places, and will that last? Very quickly, what have we learned in the past year? What do we still not know? And that knowledge gap is so critical, trying to figure out where we're gonna be, which is the final set of slides, which is pretty brief. What will the next year look like? And I wanna thank people in advance who took the time to put questions in. We've got a lot of questions, which is great. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about some common elements in two great epidemics. In addition to the HIV AIDS pandemic, these two pandemics probably have been the most um, consequential in the history that we are aware of, perhaps short of, of the bubonic plague, which of course is well before our time. And I finally this summer read John Barry's uh, book, The Great Influenza, The Story of the Deadliest Pandemic in History. And I really had to remind myself several times that I was reading about 1918 and not reading about what I was experiencing in July of 2020. And I'm gonna point out five key themes because I also believe that if we're going to make progress in dealing with the next pandemic and actually getting rid of this one, we cannot forget these fundamental issues. And this is part of the reason we really are where we are with over half a million people dead in the United States, as I'll talk about. So misinformation, rampant during the flu epidemic of 1918. They didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Facebook, but they certainly did a good job. Um, and it's in, embodied and all these quotes are from the book, uh, which, are, which I really highly recommend. Newspapers reported on the disease with the same mixture of truth and half truth, truth and distortion, truth and lies, with which they reported everything else. Lack of a coordinated response, multiple examples of how a delayed national response and lots of regional variation actually led to many deaths. And in fact, the utter waste of resources, he says in 1918 in New York City, when doctors repeatedly crossed each other's paths, entering and leaving the same building because no centralized system was used to dispatch them. I think we've seen this. The third area that was really striking is xenophobia. And we have all heard stories from friends. I've heard stories from reporters, from medical care providers who were Asian, who were targeted early on when it was being called the Wuhan flu. And the xenophobia, of course, in 1980 was largely directed towards the Germans because it was, of course, uh, World War I. And there's even a quote from the US Public Health Service officer uh, for Northeast Mississippi talking about the Hun using unwanted murder, um, using communicable diseases for unwanted murder. And then the fourth area, 
is blaming the vulnerable. There is tons of, there are tons of quotes and stories in this book about how people blamed the transmission of this infectious disease on people who really weren't healthy because they were too poor and they didn't have good hygiene. That was a big part of it. And so this sort of blaming of society's most marginalized and most vulnerable, definitely something that we have seen, unfortunately, in this pandemic. And the next slide, I think, is probably the most well-documented, most interesting, lots of references on this, if you're interested, is a direct um, association with variability in social distancing mandates and uptake. And the classic example is between Philadelphia and St. Louis. And there's a JAMA paper from 2007, as well as a PNAS paper from a little bit earlier that has modeled the effects of this and was widely cited early during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what happened was that Philadelphia decided to go ahead in the face of escalating deaths and to hold a Liberty Parade, which is shown there in a colorized version uh, in the bottom. And after that parade, death spiked dramatically. And you can see that between September and December of 1918, the relative death rates in Philadelphia and St. Louis at the peak of what was one of the first waves of the pandemic. And that really was directly related to St. Louis doing a very, very good job. Very similar to how we could compare some of our cities in the US during this current pandemic. So history repeats itself, people are people, they're generally gonna behave the same way. So it's really interesting to go back in hindsight and take a look at these parallels. Next slide, please. So let's shift to where are we now? And I, I love this website. It's um, actually a, a German uh, man who uh, mostly uses the data from Johns Hopkins, but a couple of other places. And it's interactive. You can go in and you can look at discrete periods of time. I've put the URL there for those of you interested. You can highlight specific countries. So if you wanna go in and look at a specific country, you can do that. But what I wanna point out here is that no matter, almost no matter where you look, with a few exceptions, the case counts are really plummeting. Um, and that is very encouraging. Um, some places are experiencing resurgences, but in general, if you look at the totals, they are coming down. Deaths are also declining, but very slowly. And I should note that despite the main case counts coming down, there are continued outbreaks of concern. And just today, we were emailing about some emerging outbreaks that we're seeing in colleges, particularly University of Maryland and University of Virginia, which have actually shifted um, their, their, their delivery of education because of these things. Now, what does this do to, and I'm gonna talk about that in the next slide, but I do wanna point out that vaccination clearly is increasing. As of yesterday, about 46 million people in the United States have received at least one dose of COVID, which is really staggering. Again, remember where we were at this time last year, we had not yet shut down our institution. We were still at work. I had not yet taken my last plane trip to Washington, DC. Um, and there are 20, almost 22 million people who have been fully vaccinated. So that's, that's actually impressive. It's less than what we would like, but I think it's really good. Now, I mentioned that the case counts were decreasing. One concern many of us have from an epidemiological standpoint about that is that with an enhanced effort to deliver vaccines, we have clearly seen a decline in testing. And if you don't look, you won't find, right? So if you don't test, you're not gonna find cases. Um, does that, is that something that should concern us? I think we need to be careful. If you look at the positivity rate in Alabama right now, it hasn't budged and that's because we have cases still and we are testing far fewer people. What I think is very helpful to do then is look at hospitalizations as the terminal endpoint, obviously, of the progression of this disease, because to me, that really can't lie, right? That has got to be the tip of the iceberg of the denominator or the base of infections that we're seeing. And this slide kindly is provided by Dr. Suzanne Judd, who's also been an incredible leader from the public health epidemiology standpoint during this pandemic here locally, shows you that our observed hospitalization and this is just for Alabama, have really come down since December, especially since early January. And if you carry that out, 
using what we think might be the current case rate, you're gonna to continue to see these go, go down well into March. And this is very reassuring. Now, are we out of the woods yet? I would not say so. I would think that we're probably at a plateau right now. And I think there are lots of things we could talk about that inform that, but we'll come back to that if we have time. If I could have the next slide, I think that would be great. Thanks. So Paul Sachs, who some of you may know, is a really wonderful writer and ID physician at Harvard, does a fantastic blog. Um, and he did a very nice one that you can find there where he listed five reasons that this decline might, um, might occur. And part of the reason I like his blog is because it's very practical, it's brief, um, and he's, he's usually right about things. Coronaviruses typically are seasonal, right? They cause maybe 15% of our winter colds. Could that be part of it? We don't think so. I mean, we had a huge peak, of course, in the summer, and this seems to be sort of the cycle. Now, you might say that it's the opposite of the winter coronaviruses that we see, and we may see a resurgence in the summer. We don't know. But there is the potential for seasonality in COVID, co coronaviruses, and we don't really understand why that is. Herd immunity is a really important point, and I'm going to come back to that using some of Dr. Judd's models at the end to talk about um, Alabama in particular. So we now know that about 28 million Americans, according to the CDC, have had a confirmed COVID diagnosis. And again, we know that that is the minority that were really infected. So we think that only one in five and maybe as many as one in 10 of these infections are reported. That means that the base of people who've gotten infected and presumably generated some degree of immunity could be about half the US population. That may be one of the reasons that with our escalating vaccine use, we are seeing such a marked decline in cases. That would be terrific. Um, and it would be even better if immunity lasted, which we'll come back to. What about behavior? People, I think, have been mostly compliant, but we all know that's not consistent. So could you really sort of say behavior has been good enough to do this? Certainly it's been good enough to give us some of those peaks and valleys before we had a vaccine um, that we saw, our sort of three major peaks, the fall, I'm sorry, the spring, the summer, and then the winter. Um, but I'm not sure we can really explain everything there. What about vaccines? I do think that's Ramping up, this is the CDC dose, uh, sorry, CDC um, graphic from their website just yesterday showing where we're at. We're giving about a one and a half million doses a day. So we're getting there. And I understand that there are 40 more million doses being ordered, hopefully that we should get soon, um, of the uh, mRNA vaccines, which I'll talk about. What about the virus mutating? Could it be getting less fit? It certainly is mutating to infect us more efficiently. And we'll talk about that with the variants. When viruses mutate for a certain purpose, they often make trade-offs, right? So it may be mutating so it adheres to our respiratory epithelial cells better, but it may not have the same degree of cellular pathogenicity that it did before. So that's a theory we don't know. And then of course, very possible and probable that all of these things are operative. Next slide, please. So I mentioned um, the number of deaths um, and the number of deaths not really declining dramatically yet. If you look at it, we're seeing between, um, between 1,800 and 3,000 deaths in the United States a day still. It's down by about 30%, 15 to 30% from what we had been seeing, certainly, but it's still a lot of people. And of course, on February 23rd, we went over half a million deaths. We're now today at 509 plus thousand. And it's an incredible statistic. And I think it's important to pause and really try to absorb the fact that the United States accounts for 20% of the world's known coronavirus related deaths, but makes up just 4.25% of the global population. Now, this does not account for the fact that many deaths in other countries are probably going unreported as due to COVID, particularly in under resources or resource limited areas like Sub-Saharan Africa. Lots of suggestion that those deaths are being vastly undercounted, but still about one in 670 Americans has died of COVID-19. And this was the memorial when we hit 400,000. It's worse than that because the mortality effects have not only been pervasive enough to cause for the first time in the United States since World War II, 
a decrease in life expectancy. And this was just reported last week um, in the National Vital Statistics uh, document, but you can see that the national life expectancy at birth by sex is shown here and there in 2019 to 2020, you see a loss of about a year and that is directly related to COVID. What is worse than that is that as we know, COVID affects people who are already most vulnerable to bad health outcomes or may have predisposition to some of the comorbidities that are associated with bad health outcomes. And when you break down that change in life expectancy at birth by Hispanic origin and race and sex, you see really awful statistics. So you can see that if you are a non-Hispanic black male on average, your lifespan has reduced, not your, but in general, the lifespan of this group of men has been reduced by three years, three years in one year of COVID. And if that doesn't wake you up and make you want to scream, honestly, I don't know what else should. Um, the numbers are not much better for Hispanic men, non-Hispanic Black women, somewhat um, about the same for Hispanic women, interestingly enough, but really sobering and disturbing numbers that I hope get us to look more carefully at um, health disparities in this setting. Next slide, please. So shifting from where we are, let's talk briefly about what we've learned. And I'm not going to do a primer on COVID uh, infection because you all are not only very experienced and have seen some of the highest numbers of COVID in the country, um, but I think um, we want to talk about some newer data and in fact, some data hot off the press, which is very exciting. So what have we learned in the last six months? Just to review, we know that many infections are completely asymptomatic and combined with the pre-symptomatic phase, meaning that period before you develop symptoms, you probably, this group probably accounts for at least half of transmission. That's why this is such a nefarious infection because you can't screen people for symptoms. You can't screen them using a temperature gauge. So you just gotta assume that everybody's potentially infectious, which is what we've been doing. Remember, person to person is considered the predominant mode of transmission, respiratory uh, transmission, coughing, sneezing, singing, talking, or breathing. I just talked to someone today who uh, didn't wanna run outside with a group of people because of this issue of even in runners who are expelling their breath quite forcefully, you can detect the COVID virus being uh, expelled in a plume. Um, also seen on bicycle riders who are exerting themselves. So um, worth thinking about. Most people have mild to moderate disease like a flu, except that they often have loss of taste and smell, which is fascinating science, which we don't have time to talk about. And then later stages, if they get worse and get more severe, they get this cytokine storm, uh, which is more of an immunologic overreaction to the virus. The risk for severe disease or death, very prominent in our state, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, chronic lung disease, cancer, chronic kidney disease, obesity, very, very, very major risk factor, and smoking. And I already mentioned the disproportionate burden of death in Black and Hispanic persons. Now, what is going on? Why do some people get this intense inflammatory COVID syndrome and other people may just have a mild flu and do well? There have been many papers now coming out recently in particular, looking at immune dysregulation in people with COVID and that dysregulation really going in a couple of different pathways the pathway that promotes inflammation is the pathway that take, gets you into the hospital and gets you sick. And I just want to point out this beautiful paper in the Journal, journal of Clinical Investigation uh, led by Nathan Erdman with uh, his and Paul Geffert's um, grad students, in particular Jake Files, that looked at um, this cellular regulation and characterized some of the phenotypes of the cells involved. And we're looking forward to seeing a lot more of that in the coming months. Next slide, please. Um, and then very big topic right now, many of you know that there has been a big grant announcement to uh, create cohorts to start studying this, which we're very excited about because we have learned that unlike any other respiratory virus I can think of, and I'm, I would be happy to be proven wrong, um, the long-term sequela of this thing are really strange. I shouldn't say unlike any because it is very similar to what was seen in a much smaller um, 
uh, frame with SARS-CoV number one and MERS, which were the two previous uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which were the two previous coronavirus um, pandemic epidemics, uh, respiratory epidemics. And you know, people found out with those folks that there were these significant persistent side effects, namely impaired diffusing capacity in the lungs, as well as exercise, PTSD, anxiety, and depression. What are we seeing with COVID and why? For one thing, the SARS-CoV-2 entry receptor, which is the ACE2 receptor, is expressed across extra pulmonary tissues. So it's very likely that's one of the pathways for why we're seeing this really um, across the body effect of, of COVID, which is really awful. The, the main things that we're seeing sort of center in the buckets of pulmonary, cardiovascular, and I would say neuropsychiatric and neuropsychologic perturbations. Um, there is a study that was published just in January, very large study from Wuhan of thousands of people, and they followed people up at six months and showed that fatigue and muscle weakness were the most common with sleep disruption, anxiety, and reduced exercise tolerance really being notable. But we're seeing at UAB in our post-COVID clinic, from what I hear, I'm not there, but I've heard talk to many providers, um, a combination of these things, and in particular, postular, post postural hypotension or the POT syndrome. So lots of things to learn about what's going on with this persistent issue and lots of extra pulmonary manifestations that we need to study. And this is just a visual to give you a sense and break up the text of all of the organs that have been implicated um, by this um, by this syndrome and also by extra pulmonary manifestations of COVID uh, in general. It's really an evil virus because it really does go everywhere. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about what we've learned and I'm gonna focus on the biomedical response. I'm not gonna talk a lot about our behavioral uh, efforts because I wanna talk about vaccines, monoclonals and some uh, active antiviral methodologies. Um, but that's obviously something we can talk about if we have time. And so we're going to go from prevention to management. Actually, I'm going to go from management to prevention as we go through this. So next slide, please. So for the management, this is a busy slide, but I don't want to spend time going over the treatment guidelines. I think, um, you know, you can certainly do that yourself. I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, we haven't gotten great at treating COVID. Um, we have definitely gotten better at managing the disease. But in terms of direct antivirals, what we have right now is remdesivir. And I think most ID physicians would say remdesivir is moderately effective at best. Um, certainly you wanna use it, um, you would not wanna not give it, but it is not a silver bullet, um, not a silver bullet that we had hoped for. The other things that have really helped, and remember remdesivir needs to be given early because the stage of COVID that it really affects is the stage of viral replication. And that's relatively early, as you can see in the time course on this slide. Um, and that's really when people come in and they have trouble breathing, they have an abnormal chest X-ray, et cetera. Um, then you get into management of the host inflammatory response phase. And somewhat to our surprise, because of contrary findings with the first SARS virus, dexamethasone turned out to be quite important in this phase. So dexamethasone is used pretty much universally in people who have gone down this route to overexpressing inflammation. Um, the other thing that is new in this slide just uh, this week or last week is that some guidelines have now added an IL-6 interleukin-6 inhibitor, tocilizumab, uh, for consideration, and that would be given for critical or very severe disease. Lots of debate about that. It's very expensive. And I think most people feel the benefit is relatively modest. And it's hard to figure out, honestly, who's going to benefit from, from it. Next slide, please. So that's a very brief overview. I want to point out about that slide that you notice there are no outpatient treatments for COVID. The one thing that we are using right now are monoclonal antibodies. And I think those are exciting. They are proving to be very good. I just heard that there is probably going to be um, an abstract presented at the retrovirus meeting um, next month, which I can't give you the details of, but it's going to, I think, show very favorable results from um, 
from that intervention in a very vulnerable population, which is really good. And certainly here at UAB, we've treated, I believe now, well over 700, probably more, I should have gotten those numbers, and have seen um, a lot of success in keeping those folks out of the hospital. So it's been very exciting. Um, but I wanna shift to talk about vaccines because that's really where I think things are getting very exciting. And there are a number of vaccine candidates. I'm going to just mention four in more detail today. That's Pfizer and Moderna, which you all know about, and hopefully many of you have actually gotten. Those are the two messenger RNA vaccines. There is a protein-based, two protein-based spike uh, vaccines, Novavax and Sanofi, which are down in the lower left corner of that slide. Um, we don't have a lot of time to talk about that, but know that they're out there and they're basically presenting the same protein that the messenger RNA vaccines are asking your cells to make. And then we're going to talk a lot about the J&J &J vaccine because it's being reviewed right now at the FDA literally as we speak. I was joking today as people were getting out of meetings to go watch it that it's sort of like a film festival for ID nerds, you know, that you get to actually watch the FDA um, advisory committee um, uh, deliberate the data on these vaccines. So I'm going to show you the data that the FDA is looking at today on the J&J &J vaccine and talk about why it's a really critical next step. So next slide, please. And Beth, I'm just going to have you um, I'll do the first discussion and then I'm just gonna have you go through this because this is sort of an animated slide. So you can just follow my lead and, and um, do, the, and do, the, do the enter and it will just go forward. So remember that the key part of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that we wanna focus on is the spike protein. That is what binds to the epithelial cells um, in your lung. And that is created by that little squiggle of messenger, uh, sorry, of the genome there, it's the red part of that genome. And what you get with these vaccines is basically a lipid nanoparticle that has the messenger RNA, the actual messenger RNA from the virus encased in this lipid man nanoparticle. That gets ingested into your muscle. Those nanoparticles are taken up by your muscle. That then makes the protein. So you're using that mRNA just as essentially a template and then you express the proteins, they come out of your cell, they go to, are picked up by antigen presenting cells, which then of course go ahead and you can keep going with this now, um, are going to interact with T cells as well as B cells. And now you're gonna get the immune cascade where these cells are making lots of these antibodies and hopefully these antibodies are basically soaking up and blocking um, the, the spike protein on the virus. And that's really how it works. It's really incredibly elegant. There is absolutely no difference in the protein generated by the Moderna and Pfizer. The only difference in those two vaccines, to my understanding, is the proprietary nature of that lipid nanoparticle. So if you get that vaccine, you can get one and probably get the other, which the CDC does allow in extraordinary or exceptional circumstances, and you'll do fine. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now, just to remind you, we were, remember when we planned these studies, we were hoping for a vaccine efficacy of maybe 50%, maybe 60%. We thought that would be fantastic. That would be higher than most influenza vaccine efficacy years. And what did we get? These are the two New England Journal papers of the intent to treat analysis um, in the vaccine versus the placebo group. And basically, the lines that go straight up are the number of cases. The lines that stay straight are the vaccine, number of cases in the vaccine, sorry, the line that goes up is the placebo. And it was remarkable. I mean, basically a vaccine efficacy of 93% and 94%. And it was way more than anybody anticipated. So it, to say it was a home run is an understatement. It was really a grand, a grand slam and relatively safe. Very good, very good. Now, what are we learning about um, today? Um, I think that this is probably, oh, oh, I just want to point out something. So, so that was the clinical trial, the clinical trial data, really exciting um, data just from the day before yesterday, actually last night came out uh, from, you may have seen some of this in the press. Um, so it's always great when things work in clinical trials, when you see those kinds of curves separating like that, you like are, are, are hysterically happy, but the real world is very different. So it's efficacy in a trial versus effectiveness in the community. And what was published in the New England Journal yesterday or the day before was the experience in Israel with 
widespread nationwide mass vaccination using the Pfizer vaccine. And I'm not going to take you through their flow chart here, but I just want to show you they had huge numbers of people, basically a million and a half in each group who were or were not vaccinated before February 1st, 2021. They went through and excluded a bunch of people and they ended up with about half a million in each cohort and they were matched to essentially look a lot like each other. And what did they find? And this was a managed care organization, so they had access to great records and it takes care of over half the people in Israel. Next slide, please. What did they find? Um, really, oh, it looks like my slide got taken out there. Um, I'll just tell you, sorry, to, for, sorry for the big buildup, but um, the efficacy um, in, in that setting was basically well over 94%. They actually looked at disease occurring in the people who were vaccinated versus not. So it's basically just a validation that you're going to, if you do a vaccine campaign right, you're going to see the same result um, in the population that you saw in the clinical trials, which is incredibly exciting. Um, so let's talk about the J&J &J vaccine. And as I mentioned, I expect that tomorrow, perhaps, maybe Sunday, we will hear whether the FDA is going to issue an emergency use authorization and why is this an exciting vaccine? And these are the data that are being considered right now. You can download them if you want to. Um, it, it, it basically, as you can see, the meeting is happening today. This is a different type of vaccine. It's a in, replication incompetent adenovirus um, that has the genetic material of the SARS-CoV-2 as protein in it and thus elicits the ability to make this protein. It's important to know that you're not gonna get infected with adenovirus, so immunocompromised people can get this. Uh, pregnant people can probably get this and that will be studied um, because it is a replication incompetent virus. The other key thing about this vaccine is that it is a single dose and it can be stored with a shelf life of three months when stored at two to eight centigrade, it's centigrade, degree centigrade. It's very, very stable. So it's excellent for getting out to areas that don't have the kind of cold chain that you need for the other ones. Um, so what they're gonna talk about today are data for those 44,000 people. And one thing I wanna point out is that they did a better job of enrolling underrepresented minorities in this study than other studies. So 20% of the participants in the J&J study are black or African-American, which I think is very good. And 10% were American Indian or Alaskan native, um, which is also very exciting, 45% were Hispanic or Latino, so great job. And I should mention our own Paul Gefford um, is the US uh, protocol lead for this study. So we're very excited for him. Next slide, please. So what did they see? Key things about this study, this is the time to first occurrence of disease in that bottom graph there. And you can see that the curves did separate. Now you're not seeing the same efficacy from a single shot of this type of vaccine. Um, in fact, if you look at efficacy overall, and you can take a look at this at your leisure, leisure it was about 66%. Um, and in the United States, that was 72%, but it was 64% in South Africa. And that was in part because of the inclusion of the South Africa variant we'll talk about. What I think is most impressive about this vaccine is that even though it's a single dose, it protected against 85% of severe disease and 100% of hospitalizations and deaths. There were seven deaths in the trial, all were in the placebo. There's also a suggestion that it may reduce asymptomatic infection. This uh, group actually looked at that in this study because they had the, the, the reasons, to, they had the ability to do that. Maybe a suggestion that there's lower efficacy in older folks. We'll see how that gets unpacked today in the FDA meeting. Um, it was 42% in adults over 60 with comorbidities, but you know, it's one of those things where if you slice and dice the data enough, you can probably find anything you want. So I think we need to see, but I think this is a very, very, very exciting development for us. Next slide, please. So we have efficacious vaccines or effective vaccines. There's no question. Now, what are the major challenges and questions that follow on? First of all, the big question is durability. How long does this protection last? And the answer is, we do not know. We're saying three months for sure. There are data to support that it's probably more like six to eight months. Again, no time to take you into that. 
Um, but certainly that's going to be a major follow up. The people in the original Pfizer and um, Moderna studies are being followed for two years. So we'll have good data, but that's really critical to our modeling efforts, right? If we have to get a booster every year, particularly with one that includes coverage for variants, that's going to be a big deal. The other thing is transmission. We still don't know for sure, although there are emerging suggestions that the vaccines <coughs> excuse me, prevent transmission. So as I showed you, there's a difference with the J&J &J vaccine in prevention of severe illness. So um, it's possible that we might not be making as big a dent on asymptomatic infection as we thought we were. Safety, lots of issues. What if you've had COVID before? Those folks are in the trials and we will be able to look at that. Certainly anecdotally, we understand for some studies that people who had COVID before do fantastic in terms of generating neutralized antibody after vaccine. And there are some who are starting to advise that people who've had COVID before, particularly symptomatic COVID, maybe only need a single dose of the vaccine. So be, uh, be aware of that. We don't know if that's gonna happen. We'll wait, we need more data. I already mentioned long-term safety. Children just on a call today with the, the vaccine treatment evaluation group. Um, and um, we should have data in Moderna um, for um, children 14 and older, actually relatively soon, um, very soon in the next month or two. And then the dose escalation, age de-escalation studies are getting ready to start. So you go down with different age groups and, and you obviously reduce the dose and, and figure out what you need to do there. Pregnant and breastfeeding women protocols also underway. And I should mention women planning to conceive. That's a very important group because in many clinical trials for everything, women need to be contracepting. But there were many women in these gigantic cohort studies who got pregnant and they're being followed. So that's very good. And then I mentioned the challenge with storage and distribution, which is one of the reasons the J&J &J vaccine is so exciting. Next slide, please. Um, and then the variants. We, we could spend the whole day talking about the variants. I just want to mention that the variants are emerging. And this is just a slide that shows you what the news was last night from the New York Times. So the news and updates, I mean, you've got multiple th things coming out every day. So there's really no way to update you. There's three big ones, of course. Um, and now there's a new one, which is the B1526, which is spreading very rapidly in New York City. Why are people worried about it? Because one of the forms has the spike mutation E484K, which we worry may escape antibodies, and that includes antibodies made by the vaccine. So we worry about that. Just remember the three areas that these variants are going to hurt us if they do. They could evolve to be more pathogenic, creating more severe disease. They could evolve to escape the immune system, which I think we're seeing. And then they have evolved, no question, the UK virus is a fantastic example to enhance likelihood of transmission. So we're really watching a pretty incredible real-time natural uh, experiment, which is scary, uh, but worth, worth knowing. And then of course, lots of effort to look at the efficacy of the vaccines in these settings. You may have heard South Africa pulled AstraZeneca because of a low rate of, of protection against that variant. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna to try to finish up soon because I think we're probably going a little bit late. This slide, um, collateral damage, again, I think we could spend a whole day talking about, but I did not want to let the opportunity go by without mentioning it. So what about the things I didn't talk about? The intensive utilization of resources for prolonged hospital stay, the acquisition of nosocomial infections. When you look at who's in our hospital who came in for COVID, Right now, over half of them are recovered from COVID, but they're for some other reason. And I know you're all seeing this, and these are really sick patients who are often in the ICU. Lots of antimicrobial resistance, right? And that is being increasingly documented in the literature. Why? These people are in the hospital a long time and they're getting a ton of antibiotics, often not appropriately. Um, healthcare team fatigue, mental health challenges, gigantic. Effects on education of medical train trainees and allied health professional nursing trainees, gigantic. And then slowdown of known COVID research, really big. And I just want to point out to you this nice, um, nice uh, letter that Stephanie Strathdy et al. did in the Lancet just in December talking about um, this issue of antimicrobial resistance. If you're interested, it's really well thought out and talks about why it's happening and what we can do about it. Next slide, please. 
Um, I really want to thank Paul Irwin, who I graciously looked at my slides and reminded me that there were silver linings of the pandemic too. So this slide is here because Paul um, uh, so thoughtfully reviewed the slides and there are silver linings. Uh, I think it's important to remember, you know, we've seen no flu this year. There have been no cases of flu at uh, Children's Hospital, um, it, which is pretty amazing. We have seen cases, but very low rates and even respiratory syncytial virus in children, very low. So social distancing worked. There is no question. And it's scary to think about how transmissible COVID is in the face of this. That, that really freaks me out. Um, lots of opportunities for students to realize that public health is cool. There's great real world work to do both in case investigation, contact tracing, and not to mention um, research, basic research and clinical research. Um, I already mentioned the health equities being completely exposed in a way I think that um, have really captured people's attention, sadly. And then, as I mentioned, people are interested in public health, um, including governmental public health, what it's like to actually do public health. And we hope and think that this is creating much more interest in our academic public health programs and in those that partner with medical schools, which we have and are building. So the question is what's next? And I think this is my last two slides, so we will stop here. And these are from Dr. Judd and really wanna thank her for her thoughtful work and her generosity in sharing these. Um, and what Suzanne has done is to sort of model when we might see herd immunity in Alabama. Now, herd immunity, as you all know, is when we have enough protection as a collective group against the virus that we just are not efficient transmitting it to each other anymore. And we think it's probably going to need to be around 70%. Um, so for Alabama, that's 3.5 million people. And one thing it's really important to recognize is that this is going to include people who have immunity from natural infection. That's why it's so important to know many, how many people have natural infection. And what Suzanne is modeling here is the contribution of people who had known infection in the orange component down there, asymptomatic infection, assuming again that that's four or five times higher than the known infections in the green, and then the vaccinated people on top. And when you look at that, you can see that we could potentially get there in May. And in fact, she was on NPR the other morning talking about this. So let's take a look at the next slide, which is a little bit more detailed. And I know it's, it's, it's a complicated slide, but let me just show you that what you need to look at when you model these things are how many undiagnosed infections there are. So if you go to the, if you go to, let's just say the best case scenario, which is, down in five, I can't point because I don't think you can see my screen, but let's say for every known infection, there were five infections. Um, let's say that all of, thank you, uh, Beth, all of those cases overlap with people who are vaccinated um, and you basically keep vaccinating um, as much as you can and that these columns are just the level of vaccination rate relative to a standard. I mean, you can see here that you could attain um, herd immunity as early as the spring. Is that likely? Are there really that many people who are immune from, from their infection that they've had in the past year? We really don't know. So the point is that there is a range probably from this spring all the way to December at the worst case scenario. And we'll really just need to see what that looks like. So next slide, please. Um, and again, lots of, sorry, that I just, you don't have to go back to it. I just wanna point out that that model assumes lots of things. It doesn't account for the role of children. It doesn't account for how long people are infectious. Um, it, and it doesn't account for how, how extensively and quickly we are, are vaccinating. So I'll stop there. And I really wanna thank you again uh, for giving me the time to talk. Thanks. Well, this is uh, John Wheat. I'm the uh, president of the Medical Alumni Association. And uh, my first thought is, wow. Uh, what a, a, a comprehensive and, and good overview. Uh, I would like to thank Dean Gonerman for selecting such a spot on topic and speaker for the uh, Reynolds uh, Finley Lecture. Uh, thank Dr. Vickers for setting the stage and, and leading us to anticipate something that turned out even better than we were led to anticipate. Uh, 
Let me uh, say that I have uh, two uh, duties at this stage of the game. Number one is to moderate questions, and number two is to do just a little bit of a housekeeping. Let me uh, do the housekeeping first, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get on with it. Um, first, uh, we had more than two pages of, uh, of questions submitted before the, uh, the uh, uh, lecture, and so we have, uh, uh, are going to begin to address some of those. We don't have enough time to address them all, so it is almost assured that we will not be in a position to take uh, uh, questions from the, from the group today. However, we want to answer your questions. So please do record your questions in the chat box and or send an email to Meredith uh, and, and uh, we, we'll do our best to, uh, to get to those as soon as we can. Uh, so uh, let's see. Now, the other thing is about uh, a CME. Uh, for those of you who are uh, concerned about CME, know that we have uh, uh, taken a list and know everybody that's on this uh, 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 call, and 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 uh, we will send you uh, your CME certificate uh, by email within a few weeks. So, given that, it is now uh, a, a an honor to uh, be able to invite uh, Dr. Marazzo to uh, handle some questions. And the first question that I have is this, if I have already had COVID-19 and recovered, do I still need to get vaccinated with a COVID-19 vaccine? That is such a good question. Right now, the answer is yes, um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that not everybody probably makes as robust an immune response to this virus as others. So some people clearly generate the kinds of neutralizing antibodies that we've been talking about um, and do really well and look good after they've been infected. Other people do not. Now, there's some caveats with that. When we measure antibodies, we're generally only measuring a relatively small part of the huge repertoire that people make when they're infected. So, you know, it may not be the perfect thing, but we really know that a substantial number of people just don't do as well as they should. And especially if you're older or you're not able to do it, right? The other reason um, is that we still don't know how long natural immunity lasts. So we do think it lasts at least three months, which is why we've changed remember a lot of recommendations for repeating testing and all that sort of stuff, but we don't know. So it may be that six months after you're infected, eight months after you're infected, you're as vulnerable as somebody who's never been infected. We just don't know. So it might be true in the future, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Number two, do I need to wear a mask and avoid close contact with others if I've gotten my two doses of a vaccine? I'm so sorry, but yes, right now you do. And the reason for that is similar to what I just said. Um, we think everybody's going to do probably great in terms of the vaccines, robust immune response. The problem is we still don't know if it really prevents acquisition of asymptomatic infections, although those J&J &J data are encouraging. I didn't show you the actual data, but trust me, they're encouraging. And we don't know if it prevents um, uh, transmission. Um, and, that, and that's really the issue. And then the third reason I really hate this is these variants. So if we start to see variants that really do a good job of evading the immune response induced by the vaccine, you're going to be happy that you wore a mask. I hope we can get rid of them. I'm ready to get rid of them more than anybody. I'm getting used to them. <laughs> can I get COVID-19 vaccine at the same time I get another vaccination? Ideally, no. You want to wait two weeks. Um, so two weeks before, two weeks after. And a lot of people have asked me that, particularly about shingles vaccine, uh, the Shingrix vaccine. So I would wait at least two weeks, and that's what the CDC recommends. But other than that, you're okay. Okay, dope. Now, I want to... Uh, just look down the list of all those we got uh, uh, previously and, and, and maybe pick out uh, a couple or three questions that uh, may or may not be randomly. Uh, let me ask you this. Do you think that proof of vaccination will supplant testing in order to get uh, an okay to fly, to travel, or to have same day surgery? I do um, at some point. In fact, there are already some places, particularly tour operators, 
um, who are starting up again this summer, who are requiring proof of vaccination, they may be taking you to a place where the country itself requires screening for a negative test. So I think for a while, it's gonna be a mix and match. Um, eventually it may get to the point, again, it's gonna take a question, it's gonna be the question of how long do these vaccines last? Um, if we have great data that if you're vaccinated within the last year, you're good to go for a year, then I think your vaccine would be great. We would love to get rid of the pre-travel screening because it's a false, it's a really false sense of assurance, right? Just because you're negative when you start travel doesn't mean that you're gonna be completely uninfected. You can be very early in infection, so. We had a couple or more questions related to uh, the variants and mutation. Uh, so it, uh, how will variants impede our progress in managing the pandemic? And how likely is it that uh, uh, we'll have to take booster shots to allow us to uh, return safely to normal activity? You know, I think we'll know the role of variants in the coming month or so uh, for a couple of reasons. One. The CDC has a dashboard now, um, which is cool for the variant. So you can actually go in there and you can look at your state and you can find out how many instances of the virus have been detected. But remember, to detect these variants, you need very sophisticated molecular sequencing. This is not something you're going to get at your average um, your average clinic or your average hospital. In fact, um, we are doing it at UAB in Louisiana. Um, the folks at LSU are doing it. Um, and the CDC just announced a big investment in molecular sequence surveillance. So they're now going to start getting representative samples of the viruses. But right now, we're mostly sequencing people who seem like they should be tested for it. They may have failed their vaccine. They may be consistently shedding. They may be really sick. So long story short, to say we don't really know. The worst case scenario is that you have a combination of this new New York variant with the UK variant, with the South African variant, and you get something that's more infection in which, more infective in which the vaccine doesn't work. And, you know, all of this stuff is coming at the same time, right? We're ramping up vaccine while the variants are emerging. So it's kind of trying to film it in real life and make sense of the reels as you assemble them. So we'll see. Okay, now let me uh, get into a little bit of policy type questions. Um, in case of vaccination refusal, uh, is there a role for mandates in our society? Um, I think it's an excellent question. And I think that the answer is sometimes. Um, and I would look to the influenza vaccine. Um, you know, we mandate the flu vaccine for healthcare workers in some places. Um, in some places, they do not. Um, there is variable data to say whether that consistently reduces the rate of, um, of hospitalization associated flu, but I think most of us feel it's the right thing to do. Could we get to a place where that's true for SARS-CoV-2? Absolutely. Um, especially knowing how devastating the effect of the virus was infecting healthcare workers, right? I mean, so many died. And then of course, there are um, their experience taking care of them. Um, the other thing is nursing homes. So you, I didn't have time to present this, but there has been a dramatic precipitous drop in cases in nursing homes. And the thinking there is that really good infection control practices with targeted vaccination and probably monoclonal antibodies have actually helped very much. So I think we will get there, John. Um, I, I just don't know when it will, certainly not under an EUA. Uh, when these are approved, it will definitely be on the table. Okay, I am getting toward the time where uh, we've got time maybe for one more question or so. So let me ask you this one. Uh, what do we know now about how to allay the uh, anxieties surrounding vaccines, especially in the minority populations? Well, I'm just going to break break news that John Kennedy just broke. He said the FDA just endorsed the EUA for the J&J &J vaccine. So this is a really historical lecture. Um, I don't think you could have staged this any better. So strong work, uh, organizers. Um, so vaccine hesitancy and vulnerable populations. Um, we need to, <laughs> this is, again, we could talk about this for a long time. And um, this has been such a big topic. Um, 
And in talking to people who are hesitant about getting the vaccine, I think we've learned the major thing is you can't talk at people. You cannot throw scientific information at people. You cannot say in this clinical trial, it was really safe. Nobody had any problems. They have nothing, no trust in that kind of information. And really it comes down to trust and it comes down to having trust in a peer or a provider, I think, that can really gain your trust um, and tell you that, you know, I got it and I did okay. And that's what we need to work on. Um, I think the challenge with so many of our vulnerable populations is they've never really had a healthcare provider or a system that they felt they could really trust. And that is a very tragic um, side of this pandemic. So I know lots of people are working very hard, um, particularly Scott Harris at the state, lots of people in the health departments, many, many people in academics to try to, to help um, deal with this, um, but uh, it's an uphill battle and we just got to keep at it. I would uh, add to that and suggest that the health education as a component of public health really should uh, could come to the fore uh, during, during the aftermath of this. Uh, I am going to ask you uh, one more question, uh, very policy related. Why are teachers not teaching and what can be done to get them back to work? Sounds and like you can do, you know, Sounds like you should be working for the CDC because that's the CDC's <laughs> argument right now. Dr. Walensky, Rochelle Walensky has been actually taking some heat for that. Um, I, I agree with you. Um, I think with, with um, careful monitoring precautions, I, and, I, and I think John, the main rationale for my saying that is that we simply have not seen lots of outbreaks or outbreaks coming from young kids in school. I mean, they may get it, but we're not seeing them as, as being this explosive little source. Um, and, it, and there are really haven't been big events linked to that. And I think just talking with a friend of mine today who's been homeschooling three kids while working full time, both her and her husband, and, and we were talking about the challenges with reentry. I think we are probably facing for, especially for little kids, huge challenges with re-entering um, things after being out for a year. Can you imagine sort of learning, telling people not to come close to you, you know, for a year wearing a mask and all of a sudden you're going to have to re-enter. So I think they should get back as soon as they can with careful, careful monitoring. But that's my, my opinion. Okay, Jeannie, we're going to uh, uh, call a stop to it now. Again, remind everybody, please do get your questions to us either by the chat box here or by email. And uh, Gosh, we're thrilled with the response to this, uh, this uh, lecture. I, I saw at one time we had 225 participants and so on. That's, that, that's very remarkable. That's awesome. Uh, we hope that all the attendees enjoyed uh, this and, and, and got as much as I did out of it. It's fascinating. Uh, and it's at the forefront of, of all our minds, I think. Uh, thanks, you uh, attendees, for attending. And, and again, uh, Dr. Marazzo, thank you so very much for bringing us an up-to-date on this. Thank you. Please stay safe, everybody. It's really an honor and privilege. Take okay. care.